Hi listeners, this is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Whitland, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today's guest is a really unique and remarkable person. Quang, as he prefers to be called, invented and published a large fraction of the central ideas in effective altruism totally independently in Singapore, many years, sometimes decades, before the current generation got to them. I was really excited to learn more about Quang's life and background, and how he came to develop ideas that, in my view, are incredibly ahead of their time, and different from those held by almost everyone who was working around him. I've compiled a short list of his key papers and insights in the blog post to go along with this episode, which should give people a quick way to discover and explore his work, which I think would be very worthwhile for some people to do. First though, just a heads up that the second Effective Altruism Global Conference for this year is coming up at the University College London on the weekend of October 26th to 28th. Many guests from the show will be there, sharing their ideas about how to improve the world as much as possible, uh, as will I. If you like listening to these conversations, you'll be very likely to enjoy the conversations you have at EA Global as well. And if you'd like to attend, you'll need to apply soon at eaglobal.org. All right, here's Professor Yu Kuang Ng. Today, I'm speaking with Professor Yu Kuang Ng. Kuang is an economist at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. He got his PhD at Sydney University in 1971 and has since published over 250 refereed papers covering economics, biology, mathematics, philosophy, psychology, and sociology. He's most well known for his work in welfare economics, and he proposed welfare biology as a new subject. In moral philosophy, he's a strong proponent of utilitarianism and has argued for it in his work, including his book Efficiency, Equality, and Public Policy. In 2007, he was made a Distinguished Fellow of the Economic Society of Australia, the highest award that the society bestows. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Quang. Thank you. Welcome. So in your career, you've uh, kind of quite independently ended up hitting several of the key topics that the effective altruism community has uh, spent a lot of time thinking about in the last 10 years. And I, I, think, I think the main ones are focusing on the income of the poorest people in the world, thinking a lot about animal welfare, both in terms of uh, on factory farms and, and in nature as well. Um, and then also thinking, thinking long term uh, and thinking about preventing the end of civilization because of catastrophes and so on, which all ideas that, that have come up a little, a little bit gradually from different sources. But you, you were already there on, on, on top of all of these things by the 90s. Um, so so does, that, does that suggest that these topics really are kind of the right focus and that, and that anyone who was thinking seriously about, about welfare maximization is going to get to get to these topics eventually? At least to some extent, I think that is true. That is someone thinking, interested in these issues and uh, thinking deeply should come uh, to, to them. Yeah, I think reasonably, naturally. A lot of your research has to do with uh, welfare economics, which, uh, as it sounds like, is the study of how you could think about aggregating uh, the welfare of different people across society as a whole. And if you had a good theory for that, that would allow you to kind of compare how good different policies would be or different states of the world would be when, you know, some people benefit and some people might lose. And obviously, this is of interest to, to 80,000 hours because we've got to think about, you know, how, how do we want to change the world? And the, dif- the different different careers that people take might affect different people in different ways. Uh, we have to have some way of weighing those up. And you've expressed really strong views about this in, in a bunch of articles. And, and most of I think most of your most cited work is, is on this topic. So we've got efficiency, equality and public policy uh, from preference to happiness towards a more complete welfare economics, a case for happiness, cardinalism and interpersonal comparability, utility, informed preference and happiness. All of these have uh, hundreds of citations. So what are the main lines of argument that you're promoting in in all of that work? In fact, what you call aggregating people's happiness uh, to guide public policy, this uh, is better described as utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is to do that. But in fact, welfare economics, uh, you may... if you may separate welfare economics into old welfare economics and new welfare economics. Then the older type of welfare economics is closer to what you described. It's closer to utilitarianism, trying to pr- promote social welfare as uh, aggregation of individual happiness. Then uh, the older welfare economics is consistent what you described. But in fact, since about the 1930s, there emerged something called the new welfare economics. Then the new welfare economics, they're trying to make economics more positive, more scientific, and hence they try to disown interpersonal comparisons and hence uh, not try to aggregate uh, individual happiness into social welfare. And thus, uh, the new welfare economics does not use uh, 
uh, interpersonal comparison, or they try not to. And hence, I, I, I was rather amused uh, or find it ironic that some years ago, when I was reported in the Chinese press, I was described as the representative of the new welfare economics. <laughs> but it, in fact, my view is most anti-new welfare economics. I'm old welfare. My view is consistent with the old version of welfare economics in that we want to aggregate uh, utilities, we want to use social welfare as a sum of individual welfare or happiness to guide public policy. So my view in welfare economics is very old. So, so you want to do interpersonal comparisons. You're also more focused on you know, actual happiness rather than preference mm. satisfaction, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, correct. In other words, uh, if you distinguish utilitarianism into different versions, like preference, uh, using utility to represent preference and focus on preference, or using utility as another name for happiness or welfare and focus on happiness. And uh, moreover, in my definition, welfare, happiness, they are synonym, same thing, or subjective well-being is the same thing. And moreover, my, de my definition of happiness uh, philosophically is called the hedonistic definition. But hedonism is misleading because common people interpret hedonism as you just care about your own or even just current happiness, ignoring uh, your future happiness and effect on others. You just selfish and focus on your happiness. Define with that definition of hedonism, then hedonism is very bad. <laughs> but I, I adopt um, what we, I call academic philosophical definition of hedonism, which means that happiness is what we feel, what we... Uh, our subjective feeling perceived as nice feeling, like pressures, uh, including sensuous pressures and spiritual pressures, pressure in the wise sense, uh, and pain in, also in the wise sense. And your net welfare is your, all your positive feelings minus your negative feeling. Uh, in this sense, uh, it's the hedonist definition of happiness, which is the one I subscribe to. So, so a lot of people feel that you know, whether they feel happy or sad or, you know, whether they feel good or bad just doesn't capture everything that they care about. So they might suffer voluntarily in order to achieve some other goal. And that goal needn't necessarily be that they become happier. It might be that, the, you know, they have children, even if they find that very, even if that never makes them happy. Um, what, what, why, do you, why do you support hedonism in that case? Uh, I think I, I need to make two points in answer to that question. First is that many things uh, we do may involve at least temporary endurance or even suffering or pain, but it's for the objective of securing in the long term more happiness to offset your temporary suffering. Then, uh, although you, your happiness may decrease currently, but in the long term, it actually increases. Right? So uh, that's one thing. Uh, more, uh, second thing, it's still within the first point, is that even in the long run, even if you choose something that you decrease your own happiness, even in the long run, but if you do it for the happiness of others, you help others uh, about this. Uh, your, your podcast is about altruism. Uh, you contribute to the happiness of others, including in the future. So you may decrease your own happiness, but if increased happiness overall, it's still rational. Right? Uh, so uh, you may do some things that temporarily increase pain, suffering, but in the long term, it may be good for overall happiness, taking into account happiness of others. And then my second point is that, yes, that there are some behavior that are irrational, uh, possibly including having children. You mentioned <laughs> having children. Because we, we are a, a, an animal species uh, that reproduce our, ourselves, and hence we are genetically uh, wired to have certain preference that help us to reproduce ourselves, to pass on our gene to the next generation. That's why we find beautiful young girls attractive so that you go to bed with them. That's the way to pass on your genes. <laughs> but it could mean that uh, all those, your, some of your preference that help you to survive and to pass on the genes 
to have children um, may increase your biological fitness, help you to survive and reproduce, but it may or may not increase your welfare. The, the, but it, so if it does not increase your welfare, but you still, you, we may still do it because we are programmed to, to, to have such preference. Then, uh, in some sense, or according to my welfare definition of irrationality, then such preference could be irrational. So almost everyone cares about you know, happiness and suffering somewhat, but why do you think that they're the only thing that matters? Oh, in my view, ultimately, intrinsically, happiness is the only thing that is of value. Other things may have instrumental value that, for example, in the example, we suffer now to achieve something, like we, we study to pass the exam and we suffer during the process, but it helps you to learn something or to get your degree and then you can do something better. So it contributes to future welfare, which again is happiness. So something may be of instrumental value, but instrument is for to achieve something else. Something else, what is of value? Ultimately, only happiness is of value. And the fact that happiness is of value, everyone knows because everyone enjoys the nice feeling of being happy. Whereas other instruments, why they are of value, then you need to explain what ultimately they contribute to. In my view, ultimately they must contribute to happiness. May, be, may not be of your, your, your own happiness, but must be happiness of someone, which could include animals, but some uh, happy feeling that is of value. And in my view, only happiness is of ultimate intrinsic value. Nothing else is of. Some other things are of value, but only instrumental value for the ultimate value of happiness. That, that's my, uh, my main moral philosoph philosophical stance. And I, it, it sounds like the, the justification for that is that w we know it through direct personal experience that pleasure is mm. good and suffering is bad, but, but we don't have similar yeah. compelling evidence for other things that people claim yeah. are valuable. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's, ultimately speaking, that's probably the ultimate level that justifies this. Yeah. But I can also use, use one or two examples to show the unacceptability of, uh, for example, uh, people like uh, Nobel Prize winner Amartya Sen and others, uh, and also long time ago philosophers like Kant, K-A-N-T, Kant. You pronounce Kant or Kant? Kant. <laughs> Kant, yeah. Yeah. Kant. Uh, they believe in something. Uh, Kant believe in the categorical imperative. There's something uh, that good or desirable in itself or something you must follow without being justified from the consideration of happiness. That I disagree. And uh, I have a forthcoming book, a uh, contract signed and a manuscript to be delivered within days to Cambridge University Press, a book entitled Markets and Morals that uh, I have a chapter or appendix on this, which I expand and update from my previous, I, I have previous papers, including a 1990 paper that you may know uh, in Utilitas, uh, welfareism and utilitarianism, I think the title is called, that uh, justify and criticize other non non welfareist beliefs like sense and uh, Kant. Oh, uh, that, and and, and I, I said one or two examples. Uh, one example is this. In China, until about 100 years ago, be, before 100 years ago, for, for about thousands of years, then China owed Ancient Chinese believe that uh, it is imperative, it is good in itself for a we, woman not to serve two men. Not to serve two men does not mean that you cannot have two husbands, but rather it means that after you marry a man, after you go through, through the uh, marriage ceremony, you become his wife. Uh, even if he were to die, on that night, <laughs> so, so that the marriage is not actually consumed. That's it. You cannot remarry again. Not, not to mention that after some years, if your husband died, no matter how young you are, you must not remarry. If you remarry, that is 
it violates chastity. Right? So they believe that for a woman to be to be a chaste woman, you cannot ha have two husbands, even after the death of your first husband. That was a very persistent uh, belief in China. And of course, that led to a, a lot of sufferings of women. And it's only in the past 100 years, in the first few decades of uh, a century ago, uh, that many people criticized this uh, wrong morality that eventually people accept to give it up. But in, in ancient time, people think that this is something obviously moral. Violating this chastity is obviously immoral. You don't have to justify in terms of happiness. But I think this is very bad. But many people may think that this is just the foolish ancient people believe is in such wrong thing. Modern people no longer believe in that. For that particular belief in chastity, yes. But even now, right now, throughout the world, with one or two exceptions, we still have something maybe worse than that belief, which is against happiness. Which one do you think? Do you, do you have in mind what I'm talking about? Well, I guess one that jumps to mind is people seem to not, or well, they seem to be biased against people taking drugs that make them happy. Uh, that's, that's not the particular one. That, that is also arguable. But I, I have in mind the belief in the sanctity of life. So, yeah, so that even if a person is no, no hope of recovering from a serious sickness and suffer a lot, doctor cannot help him to end his life. It's a law against euthanasia. It's almost universal except one or two countries, right? So that belief in the absolute sanctity of life, I think, is similar to the ancient Chinese belief in the chastity of human. Yeah. And that led to many unnecessary suffering, in my view. Why do you think the economics profession doesn't, as a whole, agree with you? I mean, certainly many economists are sympathetic, but, but welfare economics, as you said, went down this different road where people did not, did not want to do interpersonal comparisons of welfare. Uh, the reason they try to avoid doing interpersonal comparisons need not be that they disagree with utilitarianism, but because they try to make economics more positive, more scientific. Currently... I said the new welfare economics starting from around 1930s, but in the past 20 years or so, then there's sort of a revival in that. In the past 20 years, happiness studies are being taken up by economists as well. Uh, I, I use the year 1997 as a turning point. As far as 1974, we have the Easterlin, the first Easterlin 1974 paper is the first chapter discussing happiness by an economist. I, I was later than him by four years. My first paper in the, on, econ, uh, on happiness issue was published in 1978. Uh, but uh, although 74, 78, you have some papers like uh, these two, but not many. But since 1997, uh, 1997, uh, I used 1997 as a turning point because 1997 we have a symposium of three papers published in Economic Journal all on happiness, and that uh, helped to make a revival of making many more. Not now, in the last one or two decades, many major economics journals have papers on happiness. So people are coming back to happiness. So happiness studies, happiness is more cardinal concept. And if you use happiness measure, average happiness measure of a group of people, of people in a country, then that must implicitly at least uh, have interpersonal comparisons of utility or happiness. So there's so, a revival. So economists switch from... Uh, talking about these cardinal com cardinal utilities, which are comparable between people, to to simply saying that people have an ordering of what they like from from top to bottom, uh, which which isn't interpersonally comparable, because they thought that that would be seem more rigorous and more scientific, and it, and it would allow them to do more yeah. mathematical proofs that they wanted to do. But in recent times, you're saying that they've they've come back towards doing these interpersonal comparisons, and is that mostly driven by the fact that there's now you know better better ways of measuring welfare that people feel have you know sci some scientific validity, perhaps coming out of psychology. To some extent, another factor uh, was that uh, the, the, the so-called new welfare economics attempt to having, not having to use inter 
personal comparison of welfare or utility uh, actually did not lead to a useful conclusion that, that can guide policy. They try to not having to use interpersonal comparison and cardinal utilities or happiness, but the attempt was not very successful. So partly because of that and partly because of the more popular happiness studies and maybe coming back of some common sense. Yeah, um, yeah. In my view, in my view, the importance of happiness and it's at least in, in principle compatibility is in my view obvious. It's just common sense. Yeah. I mean, it's, it may be difficult. Uh, it's difficult to compare the happiness of different persons, but it's not impossible. Yeah. In principle, it is possible. Yeah. But we, we need to improve the method. And uh, happiness studies, although now done uh, not only by psychologists and sociologists, but now also by economists and some n neuroscience as well, but still in a very, very primitive level, not well developed. The, the measurement of happiness and the, the happiness indexes obtained are not very interpersonally comparable. Uh, for example, one method of measuring happiness is people are asked to rate their own happiness over past 12 months or what, seven days or just one day, whether you are very happy, quite happy, not too happy or unhappy, or give a max between zero and 100, a hundred, you, you may rate your own happiness as 60. I may rate mine as 90, but your 60 could be bigger than my 90, right? So yeah. comparability is not very high. Yeah. But I have a paper published in 1996, Social Indicators Research, in which I propose a method of happiness measurement, which is more accurate and interpersonally comparable. What's that measure? Uh, that, that is based on the concept of uh, just perceptible increment of per happiness. Uh, if below that level, you cannot perceive a difference. Above that, you find it, oh, just a bit more happy. Uh, if B is just a bit happier than A, then the difference in happiness level, happiness at B minus happiness as A equal to 1. Uh, you define one unit as a just perceptible increment of happiness, then we can use that, and that can be used interpersonally. The, the theoretical proof that this can be used, moreover, accepting this would lead you to a social welfare function that maximizes the unweighted or equally weighted sum of individual utility or welfare or happiness. Was the, the theoretical proof of that was done in my Review of Economic Studies 1975 paper. But the empirical uh, applying this principle to do an actual happiness survey using this method was done in my 1996 social indicators research paper. Right. Okay. So th then your goal would be as a society to maximize the number of these, you know, just perceptible increments of happiness. In yes, yes, in the long term. But of course, in the short term and at the practical or political level, you must take into account that any time we have existing law, so uh, obeying law, not violating law, and we have other people not uh, violating uh, the rights of other people, all these are important. Although for me, ultimately, why all these are important, ultimately it's based on happiness. Because if we don't observe these principles, laws, freedom, rights, and so on, then for it to increase your or other people's happiness by, say, 10 units, you violate this. But the long-term effect of that violation could be a decrease of 1,000 units of happiness. So although the justification must be ultimately based on happiness, but you must take into account the side effects, the effects on the future, the effects on others. Provided you take into account all effects then ultimately only happiness matters. You said that um, the ordinal welfare economics kind of hit a dead end and didn't reach that many findings. Is that mm. because almost any policy change in a large society is going to disadvantage at least one person? And then if one person is worse yeah, off, yeah, yeah. Th th then you can't uh, really uh, say whether it's better or not. So yeah, every, everything that, becomes that, incomparable. Yeah, that, that is a main point. Yeah, correct. 
Right. So, you know, should should you raise interest rates? Should you change taxes? Mm. Just just everything it you can't yeah. you can never say uh, that something's better than something else uh, unless everyone yeah. benefits in practice. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. So if you don't use interpersonal comparison, you don't know whether <laughs> the policy is desirable or not. Right. Yeah. So it seems like if people bought into this view, it could have, you know, pretty big implications for public policy. What 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 do you think are the are the key things that this would change about government priorities? A, a key thing is that uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if a person is struggling to survive, uh, hungry, then at, at that level, uh, before the, uh, the survival and a certain level of comfort is reached, then increasing material income or consumption is very important. It helps you to decrease enormous suffering and help you to survive. And if you die, of course, you lose all your future happiness. So at the survival level, then economic factors able to earn more and consume more is very important, both at the individual level and at the social level. But after uh, this survival and a certain minimum comfort level is achieved, then recent studies in happiness show that further increase in consumption or income does not contribute significantly. It contributes a little a bit to still still further increase happiness, but very little, especially at the social level. At the individual level, everyone wants more money. Myself included, <laughs> even I want more money. Yeah. But this is largely due to relative competition. You want to earn more than others. You want to consume more than others. Then this relative competition make it individually rational, even after the level of comfort, still want more. But at the social level, this... Relative competition is upsetting between individuals. So at the level of so whole society, this relative com- competition is a zero-sum game. But instead, the higher consumption, the higher production to sustain the consumption, contribute to environmental disruption. And hence, at the social level, when you take into account environmental disruption, then they make the higher income higher consumption may actually be welfare reducing at the social level. So, okay, so there's support potentially for, for redistribution and spending money on environmental issues. But if, you, if you're focused on happiness, that there might be other ways of, you know, targeting that directly, as I was saying, perhaps with, you know, drugs or with therapy, uh, or perhaps we could use, you know, some you know, scientific inventions to make people happier without having to, you know, use money or public policy or anything like that. Have you thought about that angle? I, I yes. But uh, I, I go back to uh, continue on the previous questions uh, that follow on the failure of higher income, higher consumption to increase happiness. Then that means that instead of private consumption, then public spending, if it's spent on the right area, may contribute to social welfare better. Most economists, maybe 90% or more, are in favor of big society, small government. Because government spending involves, to to finance a government spending, you need to tax people. And economists believe that you tax people $100 million, you impose a cost on the economy, it's not just 100 million, but 130 million. That's 30% excess burden. And on the spending side, public spending, you are, people are spending money not from their own pocket, so they are less economic, so you can have inefficiency in public spending as well. This second point is correct. But the first point that taxation involves 30% ex- ex- excess burden uh, is based on the simple an- analysis that assume that without taxation, the existing market is optimal level. But that, that, is not, that assumption is wrong because before people income and consumption are taxed, we have we already have excessive income and consumption because of relative competition, because of environmental disruptions, and because both pollution are not taxed. And hence, uh, before government impose tax to finance for public spending, you already have excessive consumption and excessive income. So, say thirty or even forty percent tax on income and consumption combined may be more corrective. Correcting for the excess consumption, excess income due to environmental disruption and relative competition 
to make the situation after tax better than the situation before tax, then that means that the financing side for more public stand spending involves no additional cost of the 30%. Moreover, moreover, there's a kind of goods I call diamond goods. Diamond goods are value for its values, like diamond and gold. It's the main, why you spend many thousands of dollars buying a diamond ring or gold bar? It's not because it looks nice. A cubic zirconia looks as exactly this, as top quality diamond, yeah. but it costs a fraction of the money. Right? So it's value for the value. So taxes on that impose not only no excess burden, but no burden. So there are ways to finance more public spending that are not too costly. Okay, so your point is... So that that's argue for higher public spending. Yeah, there's quite a lot of things that you could tax that... Uh, like like diamonds, people don't enjoy consuming mm. diamonds. All they want to do is have a way of showing off the fact that they're rich. And mm. and that would work just as well if they bought diamonds and almost all of the price went to taxation because it's just as expensive to them. But now the money is going to the government and they can spend it on useful things. Yeah. Y- yes. And uh, uh, related, related to that, you, you mentioned showing off their wealth. Then uh, this is uh, not exactly a diamond effect, but conspicuous consumption effect which is related to relative competitions uh, and also emphasize, in fact, the first discussion of this uh, was done by in uh, 18, uh, 1834 by John Ray, IAE. But most economists uh, credited this to 1899 by Veblen, the conspicuous consumption. But John Ray did uh, the analysis of relative competition as well. But recent studies show that this effect of a relative competition is very important, M- more important than I even I thought before. Huh. Uh, how, how does it show that? Uh, one way is by using happiness studies. Then a number of economists, including Andrew Oswald, uh, Blanche Flower, and others, show that, uh, for example, the, the, there's a study of Chinese low-income village farmers at low income, yeah. and uh, a study in India, and another study, I think, in South Am- America, could be Peru or some countries like that, uh, which shows that even people at such low income, they, f- they, uh, they find that if their absolute income increase, they become happier, but not by as much as if their relative income increase. So that shows that the relative income effect it's bigger than the absolute income effect. It, even, even for when people, people are very poor. low income. Yeah, mm, yeah. Interesting. There are such studies. Okay, I'll find those papers and put up put up a link to them. Uh, we, we also have a have a long article that I wrote a year ago about the relationship between income and happiness, which looks at some of these studies and and, and broadly mm-hmm. agrees with you. So I'll stick up a link to that as well. What what do you think is the best argument you know against your view of welfare economics? I mean, obviously, many economists like Amartya Sen have alternative perspectives. Uh, and and that, that, well, what do you think they would say? And is there anything they say that you find convincing? Uh, I, I, I answer in two points. One point at the fundamental level, then uh, I'm, I, I may not be a modest person <laughs> I, and I may be a bit arrogant in this belief, but it's my sincere belief that at the ultimate level, then I haven't seen any valid argument against my position. But on, on a practical level that take into account instrumental political considerations, then, then Amitya Sen make, make important contribution. Not at the ultimate level, but at the practical level, the index, say, uh, his human development index is very important in, in practice. Uh, we should, that's better than, say, uh, GDP. But I, I also have a measure of better than GDP to replace uh, it as a national success indicator. I call it the Environmentally Responsible Happy Nation Index. That's published in... I think it's 2008, social indicators research, which take into account happiness, not only happiness, and lifespan, and less environmental disruption. You you have to take into account the effects on others and on the futures, and hence that may, although ultimately, fundamentally, it's happiness that counts, but you cannot just say, oh, happiness is everything, but we, we need to know what, Factors contribute to happiness. 
then many other considerations, many other studies are important, mm. right? What, what can we learn from Amartya Sen's work on, you know, how to, how to practically create happiness? Oh, for example, uh, that this, this, I think, uh, every, or most economists, including Amartya Sen and myself, would agree in that after the survival level, then equality is very important. And poverty elimination is very important. Uh, this could be common ground between Amartya Sen and me. But even if our objective finally is to promote happiness for all, to maximize social welfare in the long term, we should pay more attention to equality issues. Once we are over the survival and uh, comfort level, then further increase in national income is much less important than uh, poverty elimination, equality promotion, and environmental protection. Right? So these factors uh, become relatively much more important. So uh, talking about happiness, you, you've written that happiness, in your view, is, is unidimensional. What does unidimensional mean there? And, uh, and you, why do you unidimensional think it's... means that it can be measured in one dimension. Yeah. Higher, lower, or if... Uh, not, not only unidimensional is I also believe that happiness is cardinal, yeah. cardinally measurable, so that you can be uh, ordinary. You can only rank. You prefer A to B, B to C, but yeah. you cannot say whether the difference between A and B is larger or smaller than the difference between B and C. Hmm. But cardinal, you can. The, yeah. in, in my view, happiness is cardinally measurable on a single dimension. Yeah. So how much? So a lot of people feel that kind of there's multiple different kinds of happiness. Like you might, you know, have the enjoyment of eating food, and that, and they might think that as that's quite distinct from like, uh, you know, the enjoyment that you get from having a good relationship with someone else. Um, that yeah, yeah, I, I I agree with that too. In in that uh, because for example, to for a start, we have at least five different senses. Yeah. So our happiness from different senses, uh, sort of qualitatively different in, in, in the, the way they feel, right? Tasting yeah. nice and seeing a beautiful thing, they both give you happiness, but they are quite different. So they differ in some qualitative sense, right? Like that. But despite that, it's still measurable in a one-dimensional scale because you should, any person should still be able to measure the happiness I get from seeing this nice picture for, say, one minute, and the nice feeling I get for uh, drinking a nice cup of uh, food juice or coffee, I, I should be able to compare that in terms of which one is more. Mm. So, so even though even though they have kind of a different feel to yeah, them, that yeah. how, how, how good they are relative to one another is still comparable. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And that I, I provide in that paper that you refer to, I think 2015 Singapore Economic Review, I, I argue that why we can do that is because the biological basis for happiness. We, we are born with capacity for enjoyment and suffering, uh, which help us for our survival. And hence, we, we, we should be able to compare those happiness, net ha happiness level on a single dimensional scale in order to help us to make choices that maximize our survival. Yeah. You talked about using the, s the smallest detectable increment of, uh, of happiness increases. Uh, why would that smallest detectable increment be, be of the same value for, for every person? Yeah, uh, I, I discussed that in my 1975 review of economic studies paper. And in that framework, I use uh, a temporal. There's no time difference. But in, in the real life, of course, you can only enjoy happiness or suffering through time. Then when, when you take into account the time aspect, then you must also you, uh, adjust noticeable difference. If it's sustained for a longer time, would have more, more welfare implications. Right? But uh, for simplicity, we, if, we, if we hold the time unchanged or go to the A temporal model, ignoring the difference in time, then if a difference uh, is small enough so that it's imperceptible, then the significance must be less than a difference in happiness that you can perceive. Could yeah. it be that one person could be more perceptive about their own happiness differences than someone else? And so they you, could then... You can be more perceptive 
with respect to the objective variables, right? Says, suppose regarding the amount of sugar in, in your coffee, a, a difference in one gram may give me no difference. I cannot tell the difference. But maybe one gram is enough for you to tell a big difference. That, then one can be more perceptive than others in these objective variables like sugar. But for the subjective one, if you don't perceive it, you don't perceive it. If you perceive it, you perceive it. So subjective, the subjective sense of a just perceptible increment of happiness must be of the same moral significance if you ignore the time scale for everyone. And I derive that result from uh, what I regard as a compelling axiom. In my 1975 paper, I call uh, the axiom weak, weak, weak as is strong and weak, weak majority preference, which says that if you have 100, if a society consists of 100 individuals, and if at least half, 50 individuals prefer X to Y, and no individuals prefer Y to X, society should prefer X to Y. Well, referring uh, for simplicity, ignoring altruism, just focus on the, their preference or their happiness uh, correspond exactly. Uh, then if X and Y uh, does not cost a difference in your net happiness that you can perceive, then you are indifferent. But it costs a difference that I can perceive, then I prefer that, right? Then my, the, the axiom says that if 50 individuals prefer X to Y, no individual prefer Y to X, the society must prefer X to Y. Then that axiom gives the results that if perceptible increment of happiness must be of same moral significance. Mm, across because, all people. Uh, because it says 50, uh, 50%. It doesn't, say, it doesn't say which 50. So it could be any 50. It could be the first 50, it could be the second 50, it could be 135 uh, to 99, it could be 246 to 100. So that effectively make the just perceptible increment of happiness of any one single individual more important than uh, just unperceptible increment for any other. So that would make uh, just perceptible one of equal importance mm. across all individuals. So, so your point there is that if someone were to say, but what if someone was uh, worse off or better off, but they didn't perceive it? If you're thinking only about their feelings, it doesn't that doesn't make sense to say that someone felt better, but they couldn't perceive themselves feeling better. There's, there's a contradiction there because all that matters is their perception of it. That's, to, to answer this question, then I think we need to distinguish different meanings of perceptions. And for for my just perceptible increment of happiness to work, then it should be the actual subjective feeling of, at that level. And, but then you may have difficulty of, of measurement, but then there's a problem of practical difficulties. So it's possible that someone who may be bad in terms of conversations, so that uh, they need big subjective feeling before they are prepared or able or willing to say that, oh, that they perceive that this is better. Then, then maybe you can say that if someone is, say, culturally, some reasons, uh, not very revealing of their small perceptions, then we, we should not treat the spoken uh, perception as equal to any other. But in terms of the subjective actual feeling, then I think they are of equal moral significance. Okay, well, let's talk about welfare biology, which is a new field that you propose should exist. So welfare economics is kind of the study of human welfare in society. But you want kind of a welfare biology that unifies, you know, evolutionary theory and biological theory with, you know, what makes humans and animals uh, happy. So what, yeah, I think it's a pretty visionary idea. What, what's the argument you made in that paper? That paper raised welfare biology as a study by raising three basic questions. Which species are capable of welfare? You need to be, a species need to be sentient to be able to feel happy or pain to be capable of welfare. Whether their welfare is positive or negative and how to increase their welfare. And I use evolutionary biology and economics of economizing on cost to help answer these three questions. And one, one of the results I get is that for a species to be capable of welfare, 
it needs to be flexible or plastic in its behavior. If its behavior is 100% hardwired or programmed by genetic patterns, disposition, the, 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 the organism has no flexible choice by itself, then uh, we can rule out its ability to feel welfare. Then that means that for animal protections, we don't need to consider species that don't have such welfare, or hence we don't need to. But whether a species are capable of welfare or not, because it's, welfare is subjective, it's very dip, difficult to determine. Yeah. But whether a species is, is plastic in, in its behavior or not, it's still difficult, but easier to determine. So uh, this result helps us to find which species we need to be concerned with and which species we may safely ignore. And I suppose uh, like insects might be one of those. Oh, yeah. Uh, but we, we are not certain, but, but we can say that we are more certain that all mammals and vertebrates are capable of welfare than insects. But uh, recently there's a, a paper in Animal Sentience arguing, the, the title article arguing that fish cannot feel pain. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wrote a comment on that, questioning some of uh, its argument. But, uh, and also there's a 2014 article in Science uh, showing that even crayfish, crayfish is invertebrate. Crayfish, right? not lobster, crayfish. Yeah. Crayfish, capable of feeling worry. Because <laughs> when, when a person worry then our brain secrets a certain kind of chemicals associated with worry for humans. And then if you put a crayfish in a surrounding where it has no, it has no escape, it cannot escape from that, then the crayfish also secret the same chemical. So that suggests that it's worry. Interesting. <laughs> so yeah. if, if crayfish can worry, then it's almost certain uh, that all vertebrates should be able to worry and have <laughs> welfare. Yeah. So, it, and you didn't only want to know whether creatures are sentient or not, but also, you know, are they happy or neutral or, or unhappy in, in different conditions? Yeah, yeah. And do, do you think that evolution <clears throat> tends to make creatures that are, that are happy or unhappy or maybe just a little bit happy but not too much? In that same paper, the 1995 Biology and Philosophy paper, I also has a result showing... But this this result uh, is a, a bit less certain than the plasticity association with welfare result because it's based on some axioms which may or may not be true. But if those axioms are true, then I saw that most animals' welfare are negative. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. Unfortunately. But Why is if that? that is true, then, I, I, then I, uh, I, I mentioned in that paper that we human, uh, for, for we human, then happiness study shows that most people are happy. Our net happiness is positive. But um, my paper argues that most animals' uh, ha ha welfare are negative. What, why is that? that? Is too, uh, uh, I think it's too complicated to explain. Okay. That. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, but it's based on some uh, axioms, which may or may not be true. But if that is true, then I think that we humans has an obligation to help our... And uh, unfortunate, unlucky cousins to escape their miserable situation. But we, we, we cannot help them fully now. But in the future, when we are more advanced economically, scientifically, and ethically, then I think we should help to decrease their suffering. But even now, even now, I, I'm in favor of helping to decrease their suffering for those measures that does not cost us too much, especially for those animals that we farm to, for our food, uh, animal farming, including chicken farming. We should improve the conditions of, say, chicken farming to a level where the chickens we, uh, we farm enjoy positive instead of negative welfare. Mm. Yeah, are, are you, are you And that can be or? done. In my view, that can be done at negligible if not zero cost to human and yeah. i have a paper in animal sentience hmm. 2016 on that 
Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I'll put up uh, links to both of those papers and maybe track down that argument about uh, wild animal welfare being probably negative. Uh, and so people can people can evaluate that. Uh, are you vegetarian or vegan or do you buy kind of high welfare, high welfare meat? I- uh, I, my people who are vegetarian on moral ground, mm. but I have not been a vegetarian yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm too selfish on that, I think. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So have other uh, researchers kind of developed this idea or pushed it forward? Oh, there, uh, there, there are journals and researchers, uh, including, uh, I mentioned Anima Sentience, which is a new online journal with articles uh, on this area. And also, you mentioned the 1995 paper of mine, Biology and Philosophy on Animal Biology. Two years ago, someone interested in animal welfare called Max Carpendale interviewed me on the background of writing that paper. And this interview was first published in his own website. And then the editor of a journal called Relations Subtitle Beyond Anthropocentrism. That editor emailed two of us, said that they want to publish that interview in their journal. And we, we of course, we agreed. And it was published in 2015, is one issue in relations beyond anthropocentrism on that. Right. So, so there, there are journals devoted to these studies. Do you think that we should try to make farm animals happier on farms or, or just get rid of them by kind of inventing alternatives to meat because because people can't really be trusted to, to treat them well enough? Uh, I, I think it, not one, I may agree that not 100% of the people can be trusted to treat animals well enough. But I think the majority, if we have the right uh, legislation, and a reasonably competent government to enforce the legislations, then I think the majority can achieve a level. Uh, my hope is to raise the net welfare level of farm animal, chicken in particular, to, to a level where their net welfare is positive. Then it's good for them to have such a life. Then <laughs> meat yeah. eating, that's, that's one of the reasons I have not given up meat eating. Because in my view, it's more important to fight to, for the increase in the net welfare of this farm animal, at least until they are positive. Hmm. So that yeah. on the whole, they are not suffering, but rather enjoying life. Yeah. Then having a life of being a farm chicken is, is a reasonably good life. Then it's good for them for, yeah. to, to have this life than not at all. I think I'm, I'm a little bit more skeptical than you, maybe, that people can be persuaded to, <laughs> to spend the money required to, to treat animals properly or that we could get the legislation passed just because it seems... I mean, I guess you never know what will happen in the long term, but, uh, but at the moment it seems hard. And I suppose also I worry that even if animals are, are treated well, that it could still be wrong to kill them. That, may, that would require, you know, having yeah. other, other values other than, other than utilitarianism. But, but I do yeah, worry, yeah. you know, you know what, what, if it's, what if it's actually is, is terrible to, to, to kill animals, you know, even if they've had a good life? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always nervous about, about those potential kind of rights violations as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, since I'm uh, 100% uh, <laughs> welfareism, yeah. utilitarian, then uh, I, I see all rights as ultimately justified by welfare maximization. Then, in my view, if we can increase the net welfare to positive, then I don't mind uh, having farm animal. But th- that is not yet quite achievable right now. Uh, right now, I think our aim is to decrease those more horrible forms of suffering, like the eel cutting and, say, to increase chicken size, which may not be enough to make their net welfare positive, but at least to decrease their suffering uh, by a big amount. Mm, yeah. It's the immediate tasks yeah. of those concerned with animal welfare. Does your theory of welfare biology give us any idea of how conscious we should expect animals to be relative to one another? Like, does it give us any idea of whether a cow feels more than a chicken or a pig or a human? Those answer to those, without using my theory, we may have some rough guide in terms of different uh, development that level, like in, in terms of primates being higher than vertebrates, being higher than invertebrates. But my, my theory, uh, that's the 1995 
of a biology paper in biology and philosophy, mainly help answer uh, trying to see which species are capable of welfare. If a species uh, is not capable of welfare or self, hence not capable of suffering, then we don't have to be too much concerned of mistreating them. Like we don't have to be concerned about mistreating the table. <laughs> <Bang>. <laughs> Yeah. Bang on the table. We don't don't worry. Hopefully, about hopefully not. Of hopefully the not. Table because it hasn't got feeling, right? So my my theory helped us to answer which species are capable of welfare, and hence we should be concerned about their welfare. And my answer is that only those species that are capable of making flexible choice, rather than having all their behavior one percent fixed by genetic programming, then they. they cannot be capable of welfare. Mm. But, but, it, but it's hard to quantify the, the amount in different yeah, yeah, species. Yeah. Yeah. For those who are flexible and may be capable of welfare, then you have further questions of which species suffering is worse than others. Then this could be partly you can use the evolutionary development stage. So presumably primates may be more capable of welfare than just vertebrates. Yeah. You, earlier, you mentioned about uh, ways, scientific ways to promote happiness. Uh, I have my own personal favorite, which is brain stimulation. Mm, okay, go on. Of the pressure center. You mentioned using drug. Uh, yeah. But drug, I think, is less efficient than brain direct stimulation of the brain. And drugs may have side effects. So I'm a little bit more cautious about drugs using, although not ruling those out. But more than 60 years ago, I think it's 1956, scientists discovered by accident that there are pressure center first in, in the mice they discovered, and then eventually in human as well. The stimulation of those, you find intense pressure, and that pressure does not diminish. Most pressure have diminishing marginal utility because we are built that way to protect us from, say, excessive eating, excessive of anything, but direct stimulation has never been done before. So we are not evolved to have diminishing marginal utility for direct stimulation, the pressure from that. It's constant high intensity, high pressure. So that is a way that you can increase our happiness a lot, in my view. But not enough research has been done to invent something that not that has been used for sickness or pain reduction, but has not been used just to increase our positive pressures. I think that can be done, but not yet done. I think that should be promoted. Okay, yeah. So you'd like to see more research on how you can yeah, do that. And, more, and, and more make, research on that. To invent something which can be safely done that everyone can use to increase happiness. And that would help to decrease depression, decrease crime, decrease hard drugs and solve a lot of social problems. Do, do you worry that people might just uh, only use this Excessive brain stimulation? Use. Yeah, yeah we, we may need to some safeguard. For example, I suggest that one safeguard could be that the electricity that can be used for such machines is supplied only between 7 and 10 p.m. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so people, people still go to work. What other technologies do you think could be very important to raising happiness in the in the long term future, other than uh, direct brain stimulation? Apart from brain stimulation, which I see uh, uh, an important area for development, uh, then I, I think genetic engineering is another bigger area. But we should be we should be careful, even with brain stimulation, so as not to produce too much negative effects. But we should even more careful <laughs> about the use of genetic engineering, so because it could be counterproductive. Yeah, and and it's I mean I mean you can stop the brain stimulation faster than you can <laughs> change someone's genes back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think eventually, eventually our welfare level is limited by our the capacity of our brain for enjoyment. But that capacity could be improved through genetic engineering. But that should be done with high care and would be relevant only in, in the future, not, not immediately. In but the very long term. For, yeah, but for brain stimulation, it can be relatively 
short to medium term is feasible. Do, do you worry at all that brain stimulation might be very reinforcing but not actually enjoyable and that people might find it hard to tell the difference? From what I know about brain stimulations, then uh, from the reports on this, I, I have not <laughs> yeah. I've not gone through brain, brain through stimulation that. myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, but from reports, it seems that those who undergo that enjoy the, the, the stimulation very much. Yeah. And I can imagine that if... If there's a chance, I I I would volunteer to, <laughs> to give <laughs> to it a do try. The experiment. Yeah, uh, I think that it must be very enjoyable, and hence I'm very supportive of exploring further. So, in 1991, you wrote a paper called "Should We Be Very Cautious or Extremely Cautious on Measures That May Involve Our Destruction," and you followed it up with uh, "Consumption Trade-offs versus Catastrophe Avoidance," and recently uh, in 2016, the importance of global extinction and climate change policy. What were you trying to tra- What were you trying to get people to pay attention to in those papers? Yeah, uh, one main point is that, for example, if you start with the Stern report in 2006 and published in 2007. The Stern report, uh, Nick Stern of UK on climate change, then they focus on consumption trade-off in that if we invest more now to protect the environment more, then we decrease. We have to decrease our consumption to provide the investment. But we hope that by investing for environmental protection now, we can have a better environment in the future so that our grandchildren have to invest less to deal with the environment and hence they can consume more. So it's a matter of valuing uh, how much we put on our foregone consumption now versus the gain of consumption of our children and grandchildren in the future. So this is consumption trade-off. Yeah. Th- this is a relevant question for issues like climate change and other environmental issues. But in my view, this is not the main problem, especially for climate change. Because environmental scientists tell us that if we have business as usual going on for the next, say, 50 or 60 years, it may be too late. Even if we start protection after 60 years from now, it may be too late. We may be going into a tipping point in year 70 from now. Even protecting from year 60 from now to 70 may be not enough. So that we may only have a window of opportunity, something that is 20, 30 years, something that is 50 or 60 years. We must do things now. Moreover, the early we do now, the less cost we save for our grandchildren and our children. So these questions, if you look only not only at the consumption tip of, but also that if we don't protect or don't protect enough, the whole world may become uninhabitable, all the human race or even all living things may die. If you take this probability into account, that is I call global extinction. This global extinction would eliminate all our future welfare, become zero. If we all die, our future welfare becomes zero. This is a big loss. So it, it may be true that some science, environmental scientists believe that this is almost certain. If you don't protect in the next 50 years, this is 80%, 90%. Maybe it's not 90%, but even 20%, even 10%, it's too big. Right? If you have to fly from London to New York and you already book your ticket, but if your, if your friend tell you that there's a report, but this report only has 10% reliability, <laughs> that that flight is going to have a time bomb on it. But would you change your flight? 10% reliability, would you change your flight? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> yeah, of course. Even 1% I yeah. change my flight. Right? Yeah. So for this human extinction, global extinction, 20%, 2%, 1%, not 0.1% is not acceptable. We should try to avoid this from being realized. So that means that the implication is that we should be waiting. Uh, my paper then shows that if you take consideration that some of our environmental protection can not only help our future grandchildren be able to consume more, but more importantly, to ensure that we they will be born. Yeah. <laughs> Instead, that the the, uh, the whole world become Barren. become extinct 
in say two two hundred or three hundred years. This law, uh, in my, I, I have some example to show that then dominates all other considerations and making environment protection very urgent and we should be spent a lot of money but need not all of, <laughs> cannot be all of our money maybe not even most but a lot of our money to protect the environment well so economists when they're making these trade-offs and figuring out how much we should spend to prevent extinction they, they usually want to you know place a dollar value on how important it would be to avoid extinction did you manage to do that and and does that then tell you you know what percentage of global gdp we should spend on you know, combating climate change for, for such analysis i prefer to use welfare comparisons okay yeah That's to, to compare in terms of welfare or utility the, the two have slight difference uh, utilities present your preference your preference may be nominated by your welfare, but may also be affected by your concern for the welfare of others or can be affected by ignorance and irrationality. But ignoring the difference, then whether your utility, welfare, happiness is treated as the same, then I, I prefer to do in terms of utility or welfare rather than money. Because money over different years, different generations may have different welfare implication. You, you can still, you can still do, mon- analyze money wise, but eventually you still have to rely on utility or welfare because money is not our ultimate objective. So to guide policy, you should, you should need you should consult the ultimate objective of welfare. Then hence I prefer using welfare analysis. Okay, so uh, when, when you do the welfare analysis, does that then suggest- I, I maximize, I maximize the integration of welfare from current to infinity, but properly discounted in, in that some people reservation about using welfare because if you might think maximize welfare or utility through the infinity, you may have non-convergence. The integral may become infinite, but without being biased against future generations, uh, on this issue, I believe that Morally, the correct comparison is any generation should be treated impartially. Our generation is as important as the next and future generations. But right now, we are certain that we exist, we are enjoying our welfare now. But next year, 100 years from now, then we are less certain whether our grandchildren will be born or not. So the welfare of our grandchildren should be equally important as our current generation welfare, but because the likelihood that their welfare would be would eventually to be enjoyed is less certain, so this degree of uncertainty can be used to discount their future welfare to the to the extent that their realization is not certain. Then, if you just use the uncertainty discount for the future welfare, then this is impartial. Then if you integrate through to infinity, it's still integrate to a finite sum. Then you can make a comparison. Between the present and the future. So uh, yeah. h- how have yeah. economists reacted to this style of argument? W- were they convinced that we should spend uh, a huge amount preventing climate change? Uh, as I told you, uh, these important works of mine were not appreciated <laughs> enough. But I, d- I did have, uh, when I published the 2016 papers, soon after that application, I received... I forgot whether it's end of last year or early this year, probably early this year. Uh, I forgot. Uh, I, I, I did receive an email from an uh, institute from Oxford University called The Future of Humanity, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've. Yeah, you uh, know that institute? The Future of Humanity yeah. Institute, yeah. yeah. Nick, no, the, Nick Bostrom they and. They have a very similar view, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they, they sent me an email uh, congratulate me on this paper saying that they, they find that my paper very, the, the view there very important and how to deal with it. I also have a um, more advanced result of, of that paper and they invite me to, uh, to participate in a, a conference that they're organizing, but because it's too far, I did not go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, so, there are some appreciation, but I hope that for such important issues should be more appreciated. <laughs> yeah. 
another underappreciated environmentally related paper of mine is uh, 2004, I published a paper in resource, I think resource and environmental economics, in which uh, I argue that economics, most economists agree with PICU, that when you have issues like pollution, it's an external cost. You should tax the external costs according to its marginal damage to the society. But the question, uh, 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 to, uh, question arises is that it's very difficult to estimate, especially for climate change. It's effect, it affects hundreds of years from now. Very difficult to estimate what's the marginal damage of an extra ton or uh, a million tons of CO2 emitted into the atmosphere. So how much to tax is difficult to estimate. And my paper argued that since we are currently investing, we call abatement spending, investing to abate the environmental disruption, like trying to decrease CO2 by planting trees, then we know what is the marginal cost of abatement. To reduce CO2 by one unit, how much it costs us. Then we should tax CO2 emission at least by this amount. I saw that. Moreover, I saw that if you use this amount of tax, then the revenue you raise is more than enough to spend on abatement investment at the social optimal level. So it provides financing for abatement spending as well. But uh, this paper has not been <laughs> Widely cited, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll see what we can do. We'll put up a link to that on the show. <laughs> uh, what do you think of other catastrophic risks that people are concerned about? So, you know, there's also the risk of nuclear war or, you know, a new disease or, you know, risks, uh, risks from new technologies like artificial intelligence. And to some extent, those things, people people focus on them less than, than climate change, which means that it might be possible to make more progress solving them. And, and those are kind of the, the main focus for a lot of the people who agree with your argument about the importance of avoiding extinction. Do, do you have any have any views on the importance of, of those uh, those problems as well? I have some views, but I I still need more time to study, yeah. uh, to learn more about uh, what's the actual situations, so I could be persuaded and change my view. Yeah. But uh, the the reasons I find uh, climate change must be one of the main focus may not be exclusive, is that if, even if climate change does not eventually cause extinctions, then the prevention of climate change would still have 99.999% likely to have good effects in the intermediate terms. Mm. You mean kind of so, pre- preventing yeah, deaths yeah. from pollution, so, particular pollution? and Yeah, yeah. reducing pollution, uh, greenhouse gases, yeah. uh, will likely be good, even if it does not cause a significant effect on eventual extinction or not. Yeah. I'll try to find a reference for this because I think it's, it might be unappreciated uh, just how bad a lot of coal and oil is for human health and the fact that a lot of um, green energy might be justified purely on that basis, uh, even we, even if climate change weren't happening. Um, I'll see if I can find find the evidence to, uh, to that, 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 that supports that point because I've read that and, and I think it's, especially with coal and coal particulates, uh, which, which I guess you might have seen in China, I think, I think the evidence for that is pretty strong. Yeah. So have any economists tried to rebut your argument about the critical importance of preventing extinction? Uh, no, partly most of them uh, have not paid enough attention to these problems. And it's true that uh, I, I, I gave some seminars and published some papers on, on this, but have not encountered <laughs> any, any anyway. button. <laughs> yeah. So they mostly just, yeah, they mostly just haven't thought about it that much. So, given your views about uh, you know welfare being the most important thing, and I guess also supporting a fairly large amount of public spending and potentially a, a, a large role for for the state uh, in as much as it can improve welfare, I imagine that that it might make some people nervous that kind of you don't value individual or autonomy enough. Do, do you worry that kind of promoting your views, you could accidentally give support to uh, you know governments that might want to oppress people uh, while, while claiming that they're improving welfare, but but actually they're not. Yeah, yeah. This is a serious. I, I I agree with the importance of this point. So so that I, I insist on welfareism and utilitarianism only at the level of moral philosophy. Mm. Yeah. But at the level, at the political, practical level, 
then moral principles, uh, uh, laws and uh, freedom, autonomy, democracy, all these are good things. I regard all these as good things at the practical level to safeguard, but why they are important? Because they help us to safeguard long-term welfare. So it's only at the ultimate, at the intrinsic, moral philosophical level, principles, good principles should ultimately be justified on welfare promotion. Because if not, then you can make the mistake, like the, an example I gave, is the no women can marry twice, right? That caused great suffering. And formerly in China for thousands of years, people think that this is intrinsically bad for a woman to marry twice, irrespective of its welfare consequences. So it seems like you're in favor of fairly high tax rates because you think so much of consumption spending is just positional. Mm. So it's just a question of who's spending more than more than other people. Do you worry that even if those high tax rates aren't bad for the current generation because of that positional issue, that they might reduce innovation and kind of uh, harm future generations because they mean kind of less economic growth and, and less scientific progress? I, I think uh, the answer depends crucially on the raising government taxes or revenue itself is not costly mm, yeah. because of the points you are familiar with, environmental costs and so on, relative competition. But the uh, question is, this government revenue can spend. If it's spent on the right area that can promote welfare, then it's better than pr- spend privately. But if it's spent on, say, doing something bad, right, fighting a, a war, against uh, neighboring countries with no just costs and causing many deaths and sufferings, then it could be worse than (laughs) private spending, right? So, but if spent on the right area, like environmental protections, and on, you you mentioned about research for the future uh, welfare, then I think on balance, more government spending means more spending on higher education research as well, which should promote Technologic science and technological advance that is good for future welfare. Yeah. So, if governments were going to spend more money, uh, what, what kinds of yeah things would you would you think are most important? Is that that kind of scientific R and D and and higher edu- and, and education spending? Include those, but not confined to those. Yeah. What what uh, other the, things? The high priorities includes, as you know, I just gave uh, Atkinson lectures uh, last week uh, at Oxford University, and their Global Priorities Institute focus on global priorities and I mentioned that uh, the preventions or actually the reductions, if even if can decrease by not point not 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 one percent, the probability of our becoming extinct. Yeah, yeah. So it would is, be kind of security and yeah, ensuring it, continuity. Have, yeah. Yeah, huge welfare implication. But that could include several areas including climate change. Yeah, why doesn't uh, your theory about the you know the overwhelming importance of preventing extinction imply that we should spend almost all of our resources on on climate change and, and other similar things? You cannot, of course, spend all our resources on okay. that because but, if you but, do that, yeah. we, we ourselves starved. die, and yeah. then if we become extinct in one generation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but probably not even uh, to the level of a bare survivor level. Yeah. Uh, because uh, I, I argue in my 1991 social choice and welfare paper that uh, for for measures that may cause our extinctions, then we need that uh, uh, for such issues. I'm in favor of expected net welfare maximizations. Then, if if our continued survival, if we, moreover, most people in this area agree that is in this and possibly the next century, which are the critical centuries. Because before the 1950s, uh, before nuclear power, then uh, our extinction were less threatened. But nuclear power is one big source. So since the 1950s, the two or three centuries uh, with higher technology, which can produce good, but can also cause danger. So if you can uh, avoid extinction in this one or two centuries, then if we can live for a long, long, infinite time or expand it into uh, other world beyond the earth, Toby Ott, yeah. <laughs> Toby Ott, O-R-D Ott, uh, has a forthcoming book on this. 
I read his uh, chapter eight, looking into the future. Then if our expected welfare in the future is infinite, then a not point trillion, not one percent of infinite is still infinite. Yeah. Then it would end up that we must spend uh, to survive labor to reduce uh, this odd. Right? Then this is like uh, the Wetzman Dismar theorem, W E I T S M A N. Wetzman in uh, about ten years ago have a Dismar theorem, which similar results like this. But but in the same paper I also argue that our expected welfare. Although I am an optimist, I also expect our expected welfare to, if we can avoid extinctions, to increase tremendously, uh, not only in scope, in terms of number of people, but also in quality, in terms uh, through brain stimulation, genetic engineering, and some future advance that we cannot imagine now, that can increase our welfare per person also to a very high level, so that our expected welfare would be enormous. Hence, this preventing extinction is very, very important in terms of expected welfare. But I still argue that it's not infinite. Yeah. And hence, I think you don't have the moral obligation to go to the best mm. survival level. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but, well, one other but, thing is but that we should we should be prepared to to spend a lot. Mm. to re- reduce the probability. Yeah. I mean, one thing is that uh, spending uh, a lot more, say, on preventing climate change could then create other risks, perhaps of, you know, e- you know, economic problems or people getting frustrated because their incomes are declining because we're just spending all of our money on climate change. So sometimes, you know, you, you could actually end up increasing the risk of extinction or increasing the, the risk of problems by spending so, so much on, on, just one, on just one issue. If, yeah. if it's just significantly higher, then I think... That risk is uh, trivial. Yeah, but but I guess that that might. I mean, set... In favor of spending significantly higher, that wouldn't cost that the different risks that you mentioned, which may be true if we spend. If it was so really extreme. Too, too much. So, uh, why did you get into academia in the first place? What's your What's your story? Oh, when I was in high school, my ambition is to become a revolutionary. We were trying to establish a communist society for Malaya then, which include the Federation of Malaya and Singapore together. But after I went to the university, uh, and I chose economics precisely because uh, I think that economics is more useful to build a new society. Instead of at, when I was in high school, I was more interested in physics, mathematics, and philosophy. But I chose economics because of the dream for the new society of communism. But after I studied economics, uh, then my views turned from extreme left towards uh, more center siding to the right wing. Moreover, the events in Russia and, and Russian sign Sino conflict in ideology and the events in China, including the Cultural Revolution, 1966 to 76, and before that, the Great Leap Forward, which proved to be a great leap downward. Uh, all those changed my view about the practicability of communism. So then, after studying economics, then I also find economics an uh, interesting subject. Uh, academically speaking, and hence I sort of naturally uh, move from a revolutionary to become an academic. <laughs> right. Uh, so I, I had no idea about this. This is the first time I'm hearing of this. So, you, <laughs> so, so was this was this when you were a teenager and you were living in Singapore? No, uh, I was in the Federation of Malaya. Okay. Uh, which now is Malaysia, but before Malaysia was formed. Uh, around 1962 or three, it was a British colony called Malaya, which included the Federation of Malaya and Singapore in the same unit. And there was a lot of civil conflict at the time. What was was communist revolution no. a real possibility? Uh, there was the the communists since after World War One, uh, the communists uh, were d- during the Japanese occupation of Malaya during World War One, then the communists was were fighting together with the British side. 
Uh, but after the end of World War One in 1945, uh, the uh, communists were still sort of legally active. But in 1948, uh, there was an emergency uh, law, which sort of the British government decided to, I think, to ban communist. Party and the communists uh, went inside the mountain, become guerrillas and still fighting the government. So they, 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 they not not very serious, but there was some uh, armed conflict between the communists and the government then. And you were sympathetic to them when when you were a teenager. It sounds like. Oh, I, I, when I was. Teenager or even before, yeah, right. uh, I was very left-wing, partly influenced by my uh, left-wing father. What What was it that made you support communism? I mean, obviously you were concerned about the welfare of everyone, but uh, but was was there more more behind it than that? Uh, I think, uh, apart from uh, general welfare, I think the main point is uh, desire to help the poor. In in that. At that time, um, Malaya, uh, which later became Malaysia, Malaya at that time was uh, income level was still quite low, so the poor were in more or less absolute poverty, uh, although not starving. Uh, Mal- Malaysia is better than some other African or uh, even China then. Malaysia income level uh, were a little bit higher, but still quite poor, so it's just desire to make the poor better off. And we uh, naively believe that communism is, is the right way, <laughs> it's the way to, go, yeah. <laughs> to achieve that purpose. <laughs> yeah. That's the, main, that's the main objective. Yeah. Uh, had, had you looked very much at what had been happening in the, in the Soviet Union around that time? Or, uh, or, or, or I guess in China? Uh, when I was born in 1942. So my, uh, when I got to I must be age about uh, 16 or so when I started to get involved and uh, thinking very left-wing. At that time, um, so it must be 1956 to 8, yeah, 56 to 8 is my uh, junior primary, uh, junior secondary school days. And at that time, um, Malaysia was sort of politically was starting to try to uh, gain independence from uh, British rule. So that's the g- general p- political background. And the, 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 the left wing was supportive of this, but uh, was also uh, trying to steer the country into uh, communism rather than the normal uh, market economy or capitalism. Yeah, interesting. Um, and I guess was there also tension then between Singapore and Malaysia? And and how did you end up uh, in in Singapore rather than rather than Malaysia? Be, be, before um, either Malaysia or Singapore uh, became independent, the two sides is they, they were both under the British rule, and I I think administratively they were put in together, and. It, it, it was treated as uh, uh, the same region. And although there's some, uh, in terms of the uh, Malay sultans, uh, there might be different between Singapore and Malaya. But for people who live there, uh, it was treated as the same country. We use the same uh, currency. Uh, we can g- go without using passport. Right, yeah, yeah. Um... So, uh, so what kind of actions did did you and your father take in, in support of communism at the at the time? And, and, and I suppose were you also involved in kind of anti anti colonialism? Yeah, yeah, we 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 were for independence, but uh, at least from what I can think personally, I was not that very anti colonialism, but rather for communism because I <laughs> of concern with poverty. Yeah, uh, but my father, from what I know. But my father, he, he may did something pro-communist activities when he was in China. But when he was in Malaysia, from what I know, he did not. He, he was a small businessman uh, supporting a big family. I see. I'm the seven. Uh, I have six brothers and sisters. <laughs> right. Older than me. Yeah. Uh, so it's a big family. So his main job is, is that. 
But I know, I know that he contributed secretly, money wise, donate okay. donate money yeah. to uh, the Malayan Communist Party, because I saw. I saw someone gave him a receipt for the <laughs> donation. I, I was a little child, maybe about six or seven, and uh, yeah, they exchanged a receipt in my presence. Right, right. <laughs> so I knew he donated money, uh, and also he he used his mouth to support communism. Uh, virtually every night after dinner, uh, except raining, then uh, uh, we have the custom of. My father would bring out many chairs in front of the shop for neighbors to come and sit and chat. Okay, then yeah. in, in those in those chatting, it's, we, we, we chatted anything, but quite a high proportion uh, was political. And my father was very uh, left wing and my left wing thinking was partly influenced by listening to, 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 to those, those propaganda. <laughs> yeah. Um, was was it dangerous to to be pro communist at the time? I think, uh, from what I know, the whole neighborhood must know that my father was pro communist. But it seems that he 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 was never threatened for that. So just just talking seems that the government seem not to pay much attention. Talking in private, if you are published in newspaper or TV, then uh, they, they'll be heavily controlled. But private talking seems that government just ignore them. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, do, do you think either of you ever considered taking up arms? Because I know that there was some some communist insurgency at the time. Uh, you know, as, as a young man, possibly you would have felt more <laughs> more enthusiastic about fighting, being a bit naive. In fact, in fact, I personally never thought of taking up arms. But but if, uh, if I were to continue on that route, which uh, after my university days and my graduate studies days, my own thinking changed from left, a very extreme left perhaps, uh, to middle uh, and right wing. Okay, yeah. yeah. Middle right. Uh, Although this is among all people. Among economists, I'm still left wing, but among all people, I'm middle, middle right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, uh, um, so uh, were I to go on on that, uh, and another difference in contrast, some of my uh, some of my left wing uh, fellow students uh, eventually took up arms, but I never uh, did. Partly because I went overseas in 1967 to do my PhD, and that that is the uh, year. 1966 uh, was the year China started their cultural revolutions, and the years 66 to 69 were the very left-wing activities turning very violent and mm. extreme left, and that influenced uh, left-wing people in Malaya as well. And then it, it was then, but that's after I le- left. Malaysia to to Australia, that uh, I heard that some of our former fellow uh, students, left wing activists, took up arms uh, or joined the com- uh, the communists, the armed communists in mm. in the mountain. Right, and right. and then some some of them got killed. But I personally, if I will continue on that route, then I cannot rule out that. If, if I did not go overseas, if I did not go to Australia, I might have <laughs> done that. Might have ended up in the same I situation. Do, uh, that, uh, but it did, and especially if, if my thinking has not gradually moved uh, against communism, if, if my thinking remains so, then uh, when uh, it, at, this, at the height of my left wing uh, level, then if, if the movement called upon me to take mm. up arms, I would take up. You would have done it. Thing. Interesting. Yeah. But but it never come across uh, of doing that. So mm. in fact, I have never touched. Never, t- <laughs> never picked up a gun. <laughs> you're, you're probably more powerful as an academic. Do you think that you, your your opinions were changed more by kind of theory that you learned in classes, or was it more experience of seeing how communism actually turned out in uh, in countries uh, like like China? I, I both both are important. It could be roughly half half, but both are important. 
that is the learning of economics uh, convinced me that capitalism is not uh, that bad. And uh, also the actual experience in China and the Sino-Soviet dispute also um, make us rethink about whether going on the route of communism is good for the people. So both, both are very important. Yeah. I mean, how did you find out about what was happening in the Cultural Revolution? Presumably, they tried to kind of cover up the, the, dark, the dark side of that. Finding out about Cultural Revolutions, yeah. uh, both, both from newspaper yeah. and radio broadcasts, we, we, yeah. we can learn about Cultural so Revolutions. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Also from correspondence, uh, because my father, being a left-winger, uh, some of my oldest and second uh, eldest brothers remain in China. They did not go to Ma- uh, Malaysia. Um, yeah. But my third and uh, a- other brothers and one sister was sent by my father from Malaysia going back to China to study. And, and then I corresponded with them quite often uh, yeah. over those years. So we also learned about the real situation within China from private correspondence with my brothers and sister. And in the initial year when they went back, then they were also very pro-communist. They were very supportive of the government. Oh, interesting. In the first few, yeah, in the first few years. But gradually you notice from correspondence, especially when, uh, when the great leap forward failed and people got hungry and the cultural revolution was very bad. So you, eventually you see that they, they were also disillusioned with. Yeah, I suppose later on they also would have seen Singapore doing quite well and Malaysia as well. So, yeah, it would be good to talk to talk more about uh, China because uh, we've, we've been thinking a bit about um, what, can be, what can be done to, uh, I guess, in- encourage China to, to, to be helpful with some of the policy issues that, that we're most interested in, things like animal welfare and, uh, and climate change and ensuring kind of international cooperation and, and, and avoiding war. Um, h- how much of your life have, have you spent in China? Altogether, I think I probably spent uh, about two and a half years. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. In uh, in mainland China, and then another two years in Hong Kong, and a few months in Macau, uh, and then another nearly two years in Taiwan. So uh, different parts of China, yeah, yeah. include Taiwan. Then quite many years. Uh, so about yeah, seven well, years altogether. Yeah. So. so uh, you were saying that uh, Mandarin is probably your strongest language now. Uh, how much of yes. the kind of policy promotion um, have you done to, to, to mainland China? And do, do you have a good sense of uh, how, how to play the politics there or how to get, how to get ideas actually taken up? Initially, I, I start, uh, started publishing articles in popular press, magazine, newspaper, starting with Hong Kong and then gradually also moved uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan, and then gradually also moved into mainland China. So now, now I, I publish more popular articles in mainland China uh, than even Singapore. I, I also uh, do something for local Singapore press, Chinese, uh, so occasionally English as well, but more Chinese. But um, main, main, partly because of demand, because it's mainland China. Press uh, seems to be more interested in, in in getting views from me, yeah, be, be, because I'm I, I guess I'm more well known as a economist in mainland China yeah. than, <laughs> than, than when I was in Australia. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. So, do, do you have any sense of uh, like how to go about trying to influence government policy in China? Uh, is it, is it something that that you can do as a writer as and as an academic? Yeah, initially, when in the initial years. Then m- most of my writings were China under uh, leadership of Deng Xiaoping uh, started reform and opening up from December 1978. So uh, I started writing uh, articles for the popular press uh, soon after that. So in, in, in the initial years, my focus is mainly on trying to support and hope to make the reform and opening up continuing rather than stop. So it's more supportive of the reform. Yeah. And also including explaining why capitalism is not that bad. 
and also uh, I, uh, including explain why Marx theory of economics was wrong or even internally inconsistent yeah in in, in, in at least one aspect and and you didn't have problems advocating these views uh, you know, oh, because d- during the eighties or nineties China was already opening up so in in fact my main focus was supportive of continue opening up although maybe some of my views may be uh, at that time may be regarded as more advanced too open I see, that yeah. could be but because it's in the general trusts of the directions so I think because of that uh, I did not get any trouble and then in the uh, in, in the last uh, one or two decades then I also focus come when it come across I also explain some what I believe as fallacies for, for example uh, that also happened in Singapore Singapore uh, I arrived in Singapore this time this time back from Australia uh, in January 2013 and the end of that month 30th of January the government Singapore published a population white paper which projected an increase in the number of populations from the 5.3 million then to 6.5 to 6.9 million for the year 2030 17 years after 2013 but in fact if you look at that increase it's just a projection the compound annual rate of increase is only ab- about 1.38 percent which compares to over two percent in in the last uh, two decades so the projection is for slowing down in the rate of growth but nine to one the people reacted against saying that this is too big a population so uh, then i wrote about explaining that in fact for the case such as singapore population growth and for many other cases as well population growth and immigration because pop, the projected population growth involve immigration as well because population the uh, natural growth in singapore is below replacement level hmm. so, so <laughs> it's mostly immigration has to rely on immigration yeah so uh, i explain why immigration in fact make local people usually better off yeah at least economically yeah, yeah. so when i see some views b- by the public or the government that in my view is based on some mistaken thinking then i also wrote to correct the mistakes yeah uh, when you were writing these articles about uh, kind of Chinese economic reform and opening up to the rest of the world, uh, did you ever kind of take meetings with government officials or you know try to be strategic about how you could influence policy there? Because I mean, it, I mean, it could be a very important piece of work because the, the, those those policy reforms potentially helped hundreds of millions of people escape poverty. So you know, influencing that it could could be a really big deal. When I wrote uh, all those many 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 hundreds of articles, I was hoping that they can have some influence of people's views and hopefully also policies. But honestly, <laughs> I see no evidence <laughs> right. of influence on policies. Although eventually the, the Chinese policy, the Chinese op- opening up reform uh, was continued and expanded. So the gender direction was in, in the direction as I hope. But that could be without my article. Yeah, it would be very hard to tell. <laughs> so I don't know of whether my own articles have yeah. achieved any Anything at all. significant change. Probably not non-significant. Probably some influence, but more of the views of people who read my articles may have some influence. Yeah. D- does it matter what you know general newspaper readers think, or does it really only matter what um, a few members of the Chinese Communist Party think? Do, do, you, do you have a sense of how the politics plays I, I out? Think, yeah, I think both are important. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, of course, if if uh, key members of the Chinese government or party are influenced, it would have much much more influence. But I think the general views may may take a longer time, but may also eventually reflected in the po- policy. But it takes work for many, many people, not just a single person. Right, yeah. mm. do, do you think that the government there is more accepting of you writing these opinion pieces because you're ethnically Chinese? Do you think that's relevant to them at all? 
I'm not sure, but I think could could be in that being ethnically Chinese, I may be taken as partly an insider. Yeah. And uh, so they may be, they may take it more as a suggestion than a criticism. Uh, that could be, I'm, I'm not very sure. Not entirely sure, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, we're thinking in, in as much as, you know, someone like me wanted to advocate for vegetarianism or something like that in China, I, I, I do wonder how accepting, uh, well, people there and, and, and especially the government would be of, you know, a foreigner coming coming and telling them what to think. I, I suspect that, that it's, it's kind of a very sensitive issue and, and it would be a sensitive issue going yeah. the other way as it, well. Yeah, that, that's true. It could be more sensitive than for someone like me saying that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it'd be uh, even more better for local Chinese to be converted first and then saying something they do. Yeah, yeah, which may be more more acceptable yeah that could be some consideration of that yes mm. do, have you ever taken meetings with uh, kind of government officials in china or hong kong or, or taiwan and tried try to change their mind about things no i th- i think anywhere including australia singapore china taiwan hong kong yeah i have not discussed or see any uh, person in power <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I see only academics, right. students. <laughs> more, you, you just more, you, you just write yeah, in the newspaper yeah. and hope that they're yeah, reading yeah. you. Hmm. If if they're willing to discuss with me, then I'm, I'm quite willing, and to have I will regard it as a chance to exert some influence. But no one asks me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If um. <laughs> If someone like me wanted to try to, you know, change economic policy in China, or you know, if I if I had an opinion about what the what the Chinese government should do, say, you know, I think that they should tax carbon uh, to reduce, cl- uh, you know, reduce carbon mm-hmm. emissions. Do you have any advice uh, that you could possibly give me on on how I could try to go about that? Yeah, because of what you mentioned about uh, someone outside uh, trying to exert some influence may may be influence here, but may also be counterproductive. Yeah. Right. Yeah, uh, because of possible resistance. So I think uh, for someone like you, it may be more effective, especially in the long run, to to support, say, the taxation of carbon on on the general ground of uh, efficiency for environmental protection at the general level first. So until there's a general consensus that the whole world, every country, should do something like that before we try to influence a particular country. It'd be more effective, I think. I suppose if, you, if a university invites you know, someone from overseas to, to give a talk and, and hear their views, then, then it's not so bad because they're, they're not lecturing people and trying to you know, engage in political advocacy overseas, potentially. But I suppose if, if it seems like you're pushing your views, forcing them onto other mm. people, then, then, that can, then they can be resistant yeah. to that. Yeah, could be. Yeah. So obviously you have like somewhat uh, unusually strong kind of uh, moral views in, in favor of uh, hedonistic utilitarianism. How does that, I mean, have you tried to advocate those views in China? And, and how does that fit with kind of Chinese, Chinese philosophy? Because it seems like it's, it's much more familiar, I imagine, inside, inside Western philosophy, uh, utilitarianism. Does, does it fit well with, with Chinese attitudes? My, my promotion of uh, my moral philosophical views are mainly in classroom. Yes. Okay. Uh, when, when I do teaching, then uh, I, uh, when relevant, then I can uh, I, 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 I may say something in favor of welfareism and utilitarianism. But it's not that I purposefully avoid that. But thinking back, then I have not focused much on general promotion of this outside of classroom, and and in particular uh, about animal welfare. Then even in classroom, especially in China, I hardly have promoted animal welfare in China yet. Although I'm not against it, uh, uh, I, I'm in favor, uh, in, uh, or except, except for the very extreme case, uh, you, you know, of in, in the wet market in Hong Kong. I, I see this only in Hong Kong. For some reason, not in Singapore, uh, not elsewhere. In Hong Kong, the, the fish sellers, fish sellers in wet market who sell, wet market sells fresh vegetables, fish and meat. The fish sellers cut their eel, the eel, the, the fish, the long eel, live eels. Yeah, it's quite horrific. To, to let them wiggling in pain, I, I guess it's 
first to attract customers and second to show that their fish uh, are very fresh. Fit, hmm. fresh. And I argue many times with uh, the sellers saying that you do, do this, the fish will feel pain. And no one challenged me that oh, fish has no feeling or anything. No one challenged me on that. But uh, one, one of them uh, argue back saying that if I don't sell my face, I will also feel pain. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not as much as being cut in half, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I gather that the reason they, they do that is to sell face, right? To attract customer eyes and so that their fish are fresh. But, but this is competitive between the fish sellers. If all fish sellers, if, if other fish sellers do that to attract and you don't do that, then maybe you sell less fish. But if the, if the government ban this practice, then they can sell uh, the, the same, same amount of fish. So yeah. it, this practice is clearly bad, bad for the fish and no good for human. So, so I, I, I did, I did wrote about that and published that in a Chinese magazine in Hong Kong. And recently, when I check up that the practice is still going on, I emailed several Hong Kong government relevant organizations to, to suggest that. But they haven't again, done anything. so far, it's not yet effective. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, how, how do you? I mean, obviously, China is a China is a huge country, and we're talking about you know Chinese Chinese people across many many different countries in this case, but. Uh, how receptive do you think people who have been raised within like a Chinese kind of moral framework or philosophical framework? How do they how do they think about just focusing on on welfare? Uh, I mean, there might be like other more traditional values or you know other things that that they think are important that uh, that potentially conflict with that. And I mean, and also, I mean, do, does Chinese philosophy suggest that animals are conscious or or not? I'm just very interested interested to learn what your, your what your experience has been uh, talking about your ideas there. I think most people at the common sense level would accept that at least higher animals and likely can go down, clearly including, uh, say, cats and dogs, and can go down to the level of chicken, fish, uh, that they are likely to have feeling. But most people uh, just, it's not that they may be morally bad, uh, just fail to pay attention that since they have feelings, then we should also be concerned of not imposing unnecessary suffering on them. I think most people uh, has not come to this level of thinking yet. Hmm. Yeah. Do, do you think it's probably easier to promote your kind of utilitarian ideas in China or, or in America? Or is it there's not much difference or uh, hard to say? I, I think... Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not sure about the answer, but I do not know for quite certainty that there are big differences. Yeah. Interesting. But okay. There may be some differences that I'm not aware of that make a big difference. But in in my view, uh, I think humanity is just one species. Although there are different races, different cultures, but uh, on some um, very basic thing. Like, in my view, the, the fact that happiness, net welfare, is intrinsically of value must be natural, known by every p- person. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So I think, yeah, there, there should be more commonality than difference. It seems like throughout your career, you, you've tended to write about the, the topics that you just think are, are most important. Do, do you feel yeah. like do you feel like that's limited your career at all, or you know made it more harder to get prestige or anything like that? Uh, should, yeah, because that's that's a trade off that often people face is pursuing what they think is most important, even if it's something strange like brain stimulation versus you know trying to get promoted as much as possible. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I tend to do research partly because of interest and partly because I believe that it's important for welfare, including animal welfare. So I do not concentrate on economics only. So that that may limit my professional achievement in the area of economics, but I think it's more than offset. In, for example, in, in my view, my welfare biology paper, 1995 paper, in terms of its potential impact and in the future when it's pay more attention, potential to decrease animal suffering and increase animal welfare in the future, 
probably more important than all my 200 odd referee papers in economics put all together. Yeah. So I, I don't... I, I don't regret spending <laughs> a lot of time on that paper. <laughs> yeah. And I suppose the, the thing there is you're writing in, in, in many of these cases, you're writing about topics or lines of argument that have very rarely been pursued by other people that, that are, yeah, that are yeah. very neglected, perhaps because, yeah, because yes. and perhaps because uh, they're not focused on a single field. And so it's harder to get yeah. professional recognition for them. Yeah, yeah. Could, could partly at least. Yeah. So at some point, you're probably going to retire. I think people probably wouldn't, wouldn't blame you. If you're, <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't blame you if, if, if you'd already retired. So I guess what would you like to say to people who are listening who might be able to you know, continue building on your, on your research in future? Yeah, of course. I hope more younger people would continue to do uh, important research, including my, the area that I have worked in, but need not be confined to those. Yeah, of course. Uh, and uh, in particular, I think... Animal suffering is, is a big negative in terms of negative welfare. So this is one area, uh, but e- equally, if not more important for humans, then is environmental protections to make sure that we so- survive for a long time. So these are the two areas, in my view, that uh, people, especially uh, consistent with the theme of your podcasts, altruism, that for Welfare of others, welfare of future generations, welfare of animals, this related to altruism, then I hope more people would pay more attention to environmental protections and animal welfare. Have you found it uh, kind of entertaining to, to see that as kind of you're approaching the end of your career, there's this large social movement that's appeared, uh, or, you know, pre- that's growing pretty fast and is interested in all of these things that you've been talking about for, <laughs> for 50 years? <laughs> <laughs> Not by 50 years. No, no. 30 <laughs> for, maybe. For about 30 years. Yeah, uh, I, I, I regard this as a very, very important movement. And hence, I con- congratulate uh, this you know, uh, few young uh, persons that have started this m- movement and has uh, already achieved very significantly in about nine years. Uh, so I hope that this movement would become even more influential. And uh, when when I was in Oxford giving the Atkinson lecture, Lu Ting, Lu Ting, Lu Lu Ting, uh, Lu Ting spoke to me for about an hour, and uh, he, he is interested in ex- extending the uh, effective altruism movement to to the east eastern countries, especially mm. China, which uh, since Mandarin is my m- m- uh, most proficient language. So if I can help in that movement, I, I, I'd be willing to do that. Yeah, that, I think that, that, would be, that would be extremely helpful. Uh, finally, you, you seem just to be an, an, an incredibly uh, cheerful person. And uh, some, of, some of your students have written to me to, to tell, uh, tell me how much they've, they enjoy your lectures and how you're just constantly telling jokes and seem to be having a great time. Do you think uh, kind of your, your happy disposition is, is mostly biological or are there things that you do to, to maintain your, your optimism? I'm surprised that you, <laughs> you got that report from my students. Or <laughs> some of well, my students. Stu- students uh, from Australia. You, from Australia. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to do, uh, hear that. Uh, the answer is that, uh, like most studies, uh, it's uh, partly biological that uh, I'm born quite optimistic. And partly you, you can promote this through learning, through practicing and through uh, some uh, attention that you can make yourself happier and you can also uh, help to make others happier. So it's both. It's yeah. not just one-sided. Do you have any uh, advice? on? Are there any things that you do to, to try to stay happy when, when circumstances are more difficult? I, I, I think you, you should remember that worrying too much, uh, you, you may want to find a way to solve the problem, but worry as itself, worrying itself uh, is seldom helpful. So you should try not to worry too much and find to try to escape the difficulties. But uh, I, I'm in the process of, of, I already had a book on happiness that give advice on this, uh, but unfortunately it's in Chinese. But I'm uh, in the process of writing uh, English version. So I hope it will be published soon. So readers are referred to that. <laughs> 
<laughs> Fantastic. Uh, my guest today has been Yu Kuang Ung. Thanks for coming on the 80,000 Hours podcast, Kuang. Thank you. Just a reminder that if you'd like to explore the most interesting papers written by Kuang, you should click through to look at the show notes for this episode and then click on the link to the blog post for the episode. And a bit down the page, you'll find the short list of papers that I suggest checking out first. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.